The date is May 5th, 1945, just days before Germany's unconditional surrender and the end of the Second World War in Europe. We are in Castle Iter, Tyrol, Austria, where perhaps the strangest battle of the war is about to take place. In one corner, we have a force of 36 men strong, consisting of soldiers of the German Wehrmacht, the American 12th Armored Division, French prisoners and members of the Austrian resistance. This ragtag force was under leadership of an equally unlikely group of three men. American Captain Jack Lee, Austrian Wehrmacht Major Sepp Gangel and Waffen-SS Commander Kurt Schroeder. In the other corner, we have swaths of German soldiers that were retreating into the Austrian mountains. <laughs> yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. To find out, we need to go back to one week ago. Castle Eater had a long and storied history before our tale takes place, none of which is important to us right now. What is important is that in late 1940, the German Reich officially leased the castle from its then current owner Franz Gruner. Originally, the castle was to be used as the headquarters of the German alliance for combating the dangers of tobacco, but it would soon be used for a much more nefarious purpose. The castle was turned into a prison for VIP prisoners. Construction of the prison finished on the 25th of May 1943, and the castle would soon host a real who is who of pre war France. By the time our battle takes place, 14 French honor prisoners were held in captivity at the castle. These were, in no particular order, former French Prime Minister Edouard Deladier, former Prime Minister and sworn enemy of Deladier Paul Renault, along with his wife Christiane Mabir, former Chief of Army Staff Maurice Gamelin, former Chief of Staff and, at least according to the other prisoners, traitor to the country Maxime Végan, and his wife marie René Josephine Végan, one of France's leading fascists and member of the Vichy government turned British spy François de la Roque, trade union leader and later Nobel Peace Prize winner Léon Jo and his wife Augusta Brooklyn, who willingly joined him in captivity, international tennis superstar and minister of health in Vichy France Jean Borotre, Michel Clemenceau, son of former French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau and himself a politician as well, and finally there were Marcel Granger, and Alfred and marie Agné Calou, who only got in because of nepotism. The former was the son-in-law to Henri Giraud, general of the Free French Forces, while the latter were respectively the brother-in-law and sister of Jean de Gaulle, president of Free France. With all of these French prisoners being in the same Nazi boat, you might assume that, despite them coming from different backgrounds, they would bond over their predicament or at least rise to a common enemy. At least, that is what you might think if you don't know anything about the French. In reality, many of the prisoners hated each other's guts. The most pronounced divides were over politics, with the prisoners being divided into three groups. The left, the right, and the enlightened centrists. In some cases, they would get along better with their German captors than with members of the other groups. This was especially surprising, as their warden was a real piece of shit, even by Nazi standards. Wimmer was widely known within the SS to be almost as cruel to his own men as he was to his enemies, of which he had many. He had made a name for himself in Poland as well as in the concentration camps of Dachau and Majdanek. In this case, making a name for himself means murdering innocent civilians and committing various war crimes. While he was ordered by his superiors to treat the VIP prisoners well, which he mostly did, the other non-honor prisoners were not so lucky. They were reportedly beaten by him in his drunken rages and threatened at gunpoint for seemingly no reason. And these were the prisoners he had been ordered to keep alive. His previous prisoners had met a much worse fate. By May 1945, it was clear that the war was about to be won in the Allies' favor. It was because of the Reich's imminent doom and the death by suicide of his superior at Dachau that Wimmer decided to pack his things and skedaddle. With their captors gone, the 15 Frenchmen were no longer prisoners, but they were certainly not yet free. The surrounding area was still infested with various retreating Wehrmacht and SS battalions, who were still loyal to their now dead leader, and who would shoot them on sight were they to attempt to escape. Luckily, their former captor Wimmer had made one out of character move before he left that may well have saved his French prisoners lives. He appointed fellow SS member Kurt Siegfried Schreder to ensure their safety. Whether he did this because he had a genuine change of heart, or because he figured that having two former French Prime Ministers in his debt could significantly increase his chances of surviving Germany's post-war occupation and war tribunals, we may never know for certain. If it was the latter, it certainly worked, 
as he was released after only four years despite his various crimes against humanity. While putting a fellow SS member in charge of saving the French prisoners might seem like an odd choice, it is not as weird as it first appears. In his younger years, Schrader had been a fanatic member of the Nazi party, joining the Hitler Youth Movement at the age of 14. He later fought in Leningrad, Serbia, Ukraine and Caen. He got severely wounded during this last battle, to the point that his doctors did not expect him to live. Luckily, he did survive, and his recovery process gave him time to think. Being already disillusioned with Nazism, he broke with his once beloved leader. Instead, he would only focus on getting through this war alive. While having a Waffen-SS officer on their side might put the prisoners a bit more at ease, he would hardly be able to do anything where the castle turned prison turned ally stronghold to actually be attacked. To ensure their safety, more help was needed, and fast. This help, they decided, would come in the form of the American troops that were rapidly advancing into Austria. Two of the other prisoners were sent out, armed with a note, a bicycle, and the order to hand the previously mentioned note to the first American they came across. The first of the two notes was carried by Yugoslavian handyman Zvonimir Kukovic. He had initially planned to go to the nearby town of Wurgel, but after finding it was still occupied by Germans, he instead made the 64 km long trip to Innsbruck. Once he arrived in Innsbruck, he handed a note to American officer John Kramer of the 409th Infantry Regiment. Kramer sent and participated in two rescue convoys, both of which failed to make it very far. The first was forced to turn back due to heavy shelling near Jenbach. The second was called off due to an even worse enemy, bureaucracy. He would have to move through the territory of the 36th Infantry Division, which was not allowed. Only two jeeps containing four soldiers and two journalists continued. What the six of them hoped to achieve against the Germans is still a mystery. The second attempt at contacting the Americans, carried out by the prison's Czech cook Andreas Krobot, turned out to be much more fruitful, even though he ended up contacting a Wehrmacht major instead of the attendant Yanks. The major in question was Sepp Gangel, who, fortunately for Krobot, also had a side hustle working for the Austrian resistance in Wurgel. Gangel had already heard of the prisoners being held in Castle Eater and had intended to launch a rescue mission himself, but he had delayed it because of two major reasons. First, he did not feel like he could beat the castle's guard force. Even though the defenders were now gone, Gangel knew that a handful of men still loyal to him would be unable to defend the castle against the surrounding SS troops, who would have the advantage in both numbers and equipment. Secondly, he also had the responsibility of defending the citizens of his town against the German troops who still roamed the area. Recent developments gave him the opportunity to kill both of these birds with the same American stone. Gangel came to the conclusion that the only way to save everyone was to hasten the arrival of the American forces. So he jumped in his car and drove to the American camp in Kufstein to offer his surrender. Gangel and his driver Klebich arrived in Kufstein some 45 minutes later. He handed the letter to the nearest American he could find, who happened to be Captain Jack Lee. Lee opened the letter and after reading it, he said with a bright smile, Looks like we're going on a rescue mission. Before going on this rescue mission, however, he first wanted to do some reconnaissance. Gangel joined Lee and another American soldier who was nicknamed Stinky, and together they went on what must have been the most awkward car ride in history. When reconnaissance was over, Lee assembled a small rescue crew consisting of seven Sherman tanks and three squads of infantrymen. This small column, he assured Gangel, would later be followed by the bulk of his platoon. Of the seven tanks and three squads of infantrymen that set out, only a few would actually make it to the castle. Three of the tanks could not make it over a small bridge and were forced to turn back. In Wurgel, they left behind two more tanks and their accompanying infantrymen to bolster the town's defenses. In what must have been a huge leap of faith from Lee, he allowed the infantrymen that were left behind to be replaced by some of the Wehrmacht soldiers that used to be under Kangol's control. One of the two remaining tanks and its crew were left behind to guard a bridge that Lee believed would be their only escape route. By the time they reached Los Iter, only Lee, Gangel, one tank affectionately nicknamed Besotten Jenny, its crew, Four American infantrymen and ten Germans were left to join Schrader and the three Wehrmacht soldiers that were already present. The French were entirely unimpressed by the rescuers, but they were in no position to complain. While the defenders were clearly outnumbered by their enemies, they had one distinct advantage. Namely, the castle was in a very easily defendable position. Attackers coming from the north, west or south side would have to advance through barbed wire barriers while defenders could fire upon them from atop the relatively safe walls. 
Attackers coming from the east would have to make their way over their main access road, which offered virtually no protection, before crossing a narrow bridge over a small ravine. The initial defense plan was simple. Gunnel and Schrader would each take half of the Germans and secure 180 degrees of the castle's perimeter. Meanwhile, the Americans, alongside Jenny, would protect the gatehouse. The friends were to stay hidden in the cellar. The fighting would start just after 4 a.m. The then sleeping Lee was jolted awake, first by the sound of gunfire and later by the slower dumping of Besot and Jenny's 50 caliber rounds. He found his men firing, to his surprise, not at the tree line, but into the surrounding ravine where approaching SS troops had managed to break through the barbed wire. Further along, the so-called tame Germans were aiming at the upper floor of a small inn for which they had been fired upon. A few more waves of SS troops approached the castle, but none of them managed to get very far. At about 6 a.m., the shooting quieted down. The defenders had managed to withstand the first few attacks, but knew that they could not hold on forever. The SS troops were yet to launch a serious attack. Up until now, they had only attempted to gauge the castle's defenses. The lull in fighting was suddenly broken by gunfire coming from the gatehouse. It had not been aimed at any approaching forces. Instead, they had fired on a tame German who attempted to escape the castle. None of the other Germans had attempted to stop him. Things went from bad to worse when their attackers were not only joined by a hundred more battle-hardened Waffen-SS soldiers, but also a 22mm anti-aircraft cannon and an 88mm gun. Slightly less disastrous, the French prisoners had refused to stay in the cellars, complaining about the cold. Knowing that they would not stand back, Lee allowed them to join him in the defense of the castle. After all, most of them had experience fighting in World War I, and they could use every man they could get. Realizing that these newly arrived troops would be a huge threat to the US forces coming to their rescue, Gungo phoned his resistance pocket with the instructions to warn the incoming Americans of these new developments. Besides warning the Americans, the resistance in Wargol also offered to send however many men it could spare, which in this case was three. With the addition of these three Austrian resistance fighters, the defense force was now complete and was ready for the real battle for Castle Eater to start. The battle started a few minutes after 10, when bullets of the 20mm cannon impacted the keep's walls. Moments later, Besot and Jenny exploded violently. The tank had been hit by an anti-tank round and the flames shot upwards from its rear deck. Its crew quickly jumped out and landed in the ravine on either side of the access road. One of them shouted, Are you dead? And the other one responded with, How the hell am I gonna answer you if I'm dead? Hell no I'm not dead! The same could not be said for Jenny, who would be the first casualty on the defender side. Sadly, she would not be the last. The death of Jenny galvanized the French defenders and they took up positions in the courtyard. Renault would later recall, A young Austrian patriot showed himself very active. The Wehrmacht lieutenant pointed out targets against which to direct our fire. I regret that I cannot confirm that I killed a single enemy. Renault moved to the gatehouse, hoping that getting closer would give him a chance to actually hit someone. Believing that his move would expose the Frenchman, Gunga launched forward to try and stop him. In his attempt to save Renault, he suddenly fell to the ground. Initial fears were confirmed when blood began pooling around his head. Gunga had been hit by the sniper fire he had tried to save Renault from. With Gunga dead and ammo quickly running out, things were beginning to look dire for our defenders. Luckily, they would be hit with a ray of hope. A phone call came in from Kramer, the major who had received the first note. He had by now joined up with the advancing 142nd regiment, and they had reached the bridge that was guarded by the tank Lee had left behind. He was inquiring about the situation of the castle. The line went dead before Lee could answer. With the phone dead and the need for relief high, Borotre came up with a daring plan. He would vault the castle walls and, disguised as an Austrian refugee, run the almost six mile long journey to the bridge to hurry them up and show them the quickest way back to the castle. He had a unique knowledge of the surrounding area due to previous escape attempts and being an athlete, he was in pristine physical condition. This, along with the fact that he was not a well trained fighter, made him the ideal, if only, candidate for a job. Once he contacted the 142nd, he demanded a uniform and a gun and they went on their way back to the castle. They made it back just in the nick of time. Lee had pulled the troops back from the outer walls and towards the keep, deploying them behind windows and on top of each staircase, intending to fight as if in a medieval battle. A squad of SS fighters was just pressing an attack on the access road when the sound of automatic weapons and tanks behind them signaled the arrival of the 142nd. The SS men quickly dispersed into the woods and their compatriots soon followed. 
The fighting was over and the battle had been won. The French honor prisoners had been freed from their German captors and more importantly, from each other. Thank you for watching, I've been Thomas and before I go, I'd like to give a quick shout out to the book The Last Battle by Stephen Harding. It covers this subject in a lot more depth than a 15 minute video ever could and it served as the inspiration for not only this video, but the entire channel. There's a link in the description if you're interested. Again, thank you for watching and I hope to see you next video where I use this graphic. I promise it makes sense in context. Hiya.